Jesus wants to meet you face to face so you can experience his extravagant grace. And we're so excited that you are here on Hope Today here with Tom and Amy and super excited about our guests that are coming up. Amy, tell us about them. I know, we love face to face and today we love trading faces. You know, identity and self-talk. Listen, cruise down any self-help aisle in Barnes and Nobles and you'll be sure to find a title promising you that your life will be changed by actualizing your effervescent, perfectly capable self. Does that make anyone else <laughs> want to throw up in your mouth? In Trading Faces, the Beeson's deep dive into the 10 identities that masquerade as truth and give readers help and hope that they exchange those false labels for true identities. Ooh, I have a feeling we might be addressing some touchy subjects today because we put our identity in so many things. You know, I, I know this for a long time was a guy thing that we would get our identity, men would get their identity out of what they did, whether they were, a, you know, whether they were a police officer or a welder or a, a professional athlete or whatever. And I've been there. I've not I haven't been to those jobs, but I've getting my identity out of a certain ministry I did and all of a sudden it wasn't there anymore. And it's like, right. it's so hard to disassociate, but you know, it's not just men, women also, so yeah. much in, in uh, you know, ministry and in the workforce and things are seeing the same things. Yeah, well, a lot of times in our culture, I feel like we take on, it's like, okay, what do I do? And all these labels and things, but that's not what it's about in the kingdom. You know, God calls us to be sons and daughters of him. And so we are adopted because of Jesus Christ. And I know right now we just yeah. even see in our culture, there's so many identity issues. There's so much self-esteem issues. There's so many people that are dealing with depression and not knowing who who they are, but we know that he is the great I am. And when we know the great I am, when we see ourselves in him, when we come face to face with him, that's when all those labels and all those things that the world places on us begin to fall off and fall away. So we are just really encouraging you today. If you're dealing with that, if you don't feel like you've arrived yet, just honey, just know you just gotta be with Jesus. You know, just have your peace in him and he will lead you every step of the way because that's our heart. I mean, we all deal with it from time to time, Amy. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, am I, am I Amy the mother? Am I Amy the pastor? Am I Amy the co-host? Like, who am I really? I cannot wait, Tom, to dive into this book. I know, it's gonna be a great discussion and I know it's gonna be profitable for all of us to, to know and to learn those things. Right now, we're gonna see if our identity is wrapped up in Stump the Host. <laughs> So we have questions from the Bible. We have not seen these, so please play along. We're hoping we can answer them. So here's the first one. Which of Adam and Eve's sons was a tiller of the ground? Cain. Cain, this would Cain. be Cain, Cain, right? Cause he Cain. was upset. Yep. Yes. yes, okay, Cain. Cain. Got the sprinkles of joy. Yay. So watch out for those gardeners now, you know, they get upset. In but. Genesis 4, <laughs> 2 is where you find that answer. Okay, our next question, are you ready? When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, where did he go? Oh shoot, Ooh. we just talked about this in church. Dang it, <laughs> like, no, for real. I'm not even, we just Jesus talked about this. John there. the uh, Baptist had been arrested. Where did he go? Oh. Where, he was, it he was, was a town. He was in Israel. In Israel? <laughs> You know, that's probably, that's a very true answer. Right that's there, real, that's a real answer. It wait, was wait, real. Because wait. remember he was talking to his disciples. He said, tell John yes. that the blind see. Yes. But he was in what? Where did he go? I mean, was it Capernaum? It's all right. Capernaum wait, 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 was the headquarters of his ministry. I will take it. Oh, that's, a, that's a fine guess That would me. be a I'm sorry, strong Pastor. guess. Literally right, so, just talking Wait, about should this. we call our lifeline? Lifeline. Oh, wait a minute. John, are you there? <laughs> Okay, do you know the answer, John? I don't, I don't, Amy's right. <laughs> look on your phone, just look uh, on your phone while we're here. <laughs> we didn't bring any technology with us. <laughs> this oh, what is, what is your best Sydney's, guess? Sydney's right, it's, it's definitely Israel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we should get out. half of it. We should get half, or final, right, answer, final answer, Capernaum. 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 
Well, we've got one more here. Let's see if we can we uh, redeem ourselves. Oh yes. Okay. As God parted the Red Sea for the Israelites, what did Moses hold out over the water? His rod. His staff. His staff. His staff. His staff. His hand. His no, hand. I just said his hand. I just said his hand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I wait. saw a Charlton Heston. I, I saw a Charlton wait. Heston hold no. his staff out. The Ten Thank Commandments you, movie lied to you. <laughs> Thank you, Larry, because I got redeemed. Charlton I said Heston his hand. Did it. So did you see the sprinkle joy? I said his hand at the last minute and it came out. You rescued Well, I mean, us. there's two options. <laughs> that, the, the staff or his hand. Yeah, what was it? Did he have it in his teeth? I Art, mean, he was holding it. <laughs> let my people go. That's uh, the well, most that's important fun. thing. Anyway. Can't watch well, I'm glad that our identity is <laughs> not wrapped up in Stump the Host. <laughs> But you know, identity battles are something that have been plaguing our culture for quite some time now. False identities have been leading people down the wrong path, and that's not what God wants for our lives. In John and Angel Beeson's new book, Trading Faces, they share the importance of knowing and understanding what your true identity is, and that identity is in Christ. Amen. John and Angel, welcome to Hope Today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Let's talk about even the title. Where did Trading Faces come from, Angel? Um, yeah, so it's with our publisher's help, it's been this process of taking a substitute identity um, that we hold on to and putting on a new identity in Christ. And so it was the process of putting off the old, like Romans 7 talks about, and putting on the new Romans 8. And so it's just been, and and the reality that we all wear masks every single day and we hide behind the masks uh, to try to prove who we are, to try to um, come up with who, you know, make something of ourselves. And we just love, yeah, that what does it look like to take off the false mask and put on the true face, the tr our, live in our true image bearing nature of who Jesus says we are. Angel, did something happen where you said, I've been living behind a mask and I need to deal with this and then I've been through it, now it's time to help others through with this. Yeah, absolutely. So God broke me back in 2013. We went into ministry, uh, came out of seminary in 2006. We just went hardcore. and. I would say that I was the fourth grade little girl who planned her wedding and really had just been setting myself up to my identity was in being a wife and being a mom one day. That's who I thought I was. And so fast forward, we get married. Fast forward, we go into ministry. Fast forward, my husband is running towards the church and I now am thinking, who the heck am I? Like I'm losing my husband to the church I'm getting angry. I'm stepping into counseling. I'm overwhelmed with the suffering and sin of the world. And my identity, my identity as wife and as mom, um, I'm, I'm losing control of it. And so I really rejected um, God's just call in my life. Um, and I ran into just a season of adultery. And it was in 2013 that God really broke me of myself and really just you know, I, I say this often when I'm sharing this story because brokenness was this moment where it was because we were pastor and counselor and, you know, living in Princeton, New Jersey, this, you know, in an evangelical, our, our world were very public, but it was this moment that said, Lord, if I, if I, all I, all I care about is I want to die being right with you and I'm living a lie. I'm living in a, a lifestyle that you have not created for me. And so break me. And if I'm homeless in the side streets of Princeton, New Jersey, then blessed be your name because you say that I'm a sheep and you're a shepherd and you promise to provide for me. And if I lose my husband, if I lose my kids, I'm safe, I'm secure in your love. And it was just this profound moment where I had to really step into a death of Angel Beeson as I knew her and really, and God just gave by his grace, by his grace, um, really taught me and purged me of old identities and just I came alive to who I am in Christ, that nothing or no circumstance can take away. 
Angel, that's such a powerful revelation of your identity in Christ. John, did you ever wear any masks? Did you ever struggle or hide behind a certain identity that was not in Christ? Absolutely, yeah. The, the other half of that story is uh, I felt called to the ministry as a 10 year old boy. And uh, so it's a beautiful gift to have that clarity of calling so young in your life. And yet, you know, fast forward to age 26 when I first enter pastoral ministry and I'm, I'm jumping into not just a calling, I'm jumping into who I think I am. And that leads to this, this season, which impacts my wife so devastatingly in terms of my neglect of her, because I genuinely can't process where my priorities lie. You know, Christ is the bridegroom of the church, and yet I'm acting as if I'm the bridegroom of the church, as if my identity is bound up in my relationship with the church as, as pastor. And uh, that just has des devastating effects on my myself because I have to run after and pursue after the affirmation of people, of congregants, as opposed to the joy and the gift of serving as a son of God. Um, and then it also results in the reality of a neg the neglect of my first calling uh, here as, as a husband. And so there's just absolutely, there's both of us kind of, the book is born out of our own journey and our own recognition of just how easy it is to be entrapped in identities which are can even be good, um, but are not ultimate. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, are walking with so many other people in that journey as well. Wow, John, so many of us try to find our identity in what we do or our gifts or our callings. Why did you start out this book with the subject of shame? Hmm. We start there because that's where the biblical story starts. That's, that's something so embedded in us. There's, there's this amazing... At, at the end of Genesis 2, as right before sin enters the picture, we have this concluding verse. Um, there's so many things that you could say about Adam and Eve in the garden before sin enters the picture. They're happy. They're joyful. They're uh, excited, exuberant, peaceful. All of those things are true. And yet the author of the, of the story chooses to say, and they were naked and without shame. And I think it's because there's something in all of us that recognizes our longing to be in a place that lives without the shame attendant speaking lies over our heart. And, um, and there's a profound a danger of us giving ear to the enemy in our, in, in our lives. And for each one of us, it's going to be a lifelong journey. And so we, we begin with shame because, because every one of us is tempted to believe uh, the word of the enemy, that not just that we have done wrong, not just that we have sin, but we are wrong. We are those who are worthless. We are those, I mean, these are all words of the enemy about ourselves. So that's why we begin with shame. You know, John and Angel, just truly appreciate your transparency about, you know, what you both walk through in terms of your marriage. And I think a lot of people can resonate and be understanding of have similar stories and situations. So can you just share with us, you know, there's a lot of shame when the marriage falls apart and our lives are falling apart. How did God meet you in the midst of that, in the middle of that, and began to change your marriage and relationship? I'm sorry, was that question directed to me? You cut out just a little bit. Oh, it could be either, either one of you, Angel or John. You can yeah, he, I mean, the Lord met us in the moment of one, um, the brokenness of repentance, the brokenness of the process of owning, you know, I got to own a hundred percent of my sin. John owned a hundred percent of his sin. We, by his grace, we didn't blame each other for the sin um, that we each chose to step into and were consumed with, uh, but we took ownership of that. And then in that process of asking for forgiveness and walking through the forgiveness, um, you you start to learn like, you, well, you you start to acknowledge and um, articulate, okay, what is it that I've been believing? Um, how did we get to this place? What were the patterns that we took into this marriage? Um, 
how did we not protect our marriage? Where are our lives falsely prioritized? And so it was just this journey of the Lord um, allowing us to rightly prioritize our life. And then in that space, yeah, like we had to make a choice. I mean, we start off with shame, but it really is an invitation for the reader. And we really pray that the reader is willing to slow down in that chapter because it's an invitation to say, Lord, if you say this about me, then I will choose to say this about me. The Lord can say it about us and we can say, no, God, like I, I, I just can't believe, you know, we let our pride get in the way or whatever. Um, but when we were able to just say, yeah, if this is what Jesus is, I, you know, I had a, a person come up to me once and he said, he would just remind me, Angel, you don't wear the old jersey anymore. You wear a new jersey, wear your new name. Mm -hmm. And it was so helpful for me because it was like, yes, I have agency. All power belongs to God, but he allows us to be part of our own sanctification journey where we can say, yes, Lord, I will, my, I will receive the power of your blood mm -hmm. for me at the and it's real for me. And if you say I can leave it at the cross, then I can get up and go and sin no more. And I can receive the truth that your blood makes me white as snow and I am pure in you. And this sin, this season of life doesn't have to define us. I'd like to ask you both where you see the uh, situation with social media right now that it just seems to have exacerbated this problem so much. What, what do we do with that? And especially with our young people, how do we uh, protect them uh, in this environment? Wow, what a great question. Yeah, I, I mean, so as human beings, we are comparison machines, right? Like we so often base our identity based on comparisons of those around us, right? I look to my neighbor and I say, am I well off? I answer that question by how well my neighbor's doing. Am I righteous? I answer that question by my coworker, or my, by my friend. And social media just turns that dial up to 100. And in the worst possible way, because of course we all know, like we're, we're being uh, let into this false kind of highlight reel of all of our friends' lives, which just compounds the shame narrative or compounds all of, all of these uh, realities in us. Uh, it, it can exacerbate the desire for us to stand out in, in being individuals and, and desire to kind of, hey, I need to differentiate myself. I need to create, cultivate kind of this, this image of who I am. All of this is extremely dangerous, right? Where the online self becomes the real self. And that's just a dangerous reality. We're actually the gift of of God and, and Christ in us is for us to find our truest identity in the quietest, most intimate, um, most personal places with God, and then to live out of that. And so, so how do we live? I mean, let's be honest, like even blatantly secular psycho psychologists would say, it's unhealthy. Um, it's a dangerous place for us to live. It doesn't mean it's, um, just purely bad, but we ought not uh, toy around with a world in which our identity is so wrapped up in, in the, the social media kind of part of our existence. And that's specifically dangerous for our children. Uh, you know, so we have a teenager and a young adult as, as kids. And man, you know, in that journey of knowing and becoming fully who we are and understanding who we are, which is a journey for all of us at every age and stage, but specifically at that age, I think we have to be very careful as parents not to allow social media to become that mirror that they're constantly looking into to, to kind of behold and think that they're understanding who they are um, when that's just absolutely not the case. So as parents, we can we need to know who we are in Christ so then we can speak that language over our kids mm -hmm. and just remind them daily and consistently who they are. Angel, we're also in a culture where we identify by how we are feeling and we're letting our feelings say what our identity is. Does that concern you at all? It's deeply concerning. And I would say it's one of the biggest misconceptions as a culture that we have um, of identity. You know, we, we, we are who we feel. 
And that can change and it's fluid. And at the end of the day, it is an identity that is built on shifting sand and it's false and it leads to an exhausting life. It's constantly never enough because the flesh will never be satisfied. The flesh will never be satisfied. And if we are what we feel and feelings are in the flesh, then we're constantly looking. We're constantly looking and they're just, you know, mask over mask over mask over mask. And no wonder people are asking, you know, we get into midlife crisis and have no idea who we are. John, can you just take a minute and just pray for anyone watching that feels like, man, I've been using my personality as a mask. I've been using my political party as a mask. I've been using my career as a mask. Can you just take a moment and pray for those that we will come face to face with our identity in Christ? Mm, I'd be honored to. Thank you. Lord, your word speaks over us who we are. Or forgive us, Lord, for looking elsewhere, for having ears that are so attuned to so many other places and other things, Lord, to draw our identity from. God, Lord, we have restless, anxious hearts, Lord, because we are trying to create our own identity. Lord, help us to rest as we know who we are in you, or that we would be found in you as saints, as your sheep, as ambassadors, mm -hmm. as those who are, are purposed to be part of, of, of your body, Lord, your family, Lord, as sons and daughters, as, as part of your bride. And Lord, in that place, Lord, help us to know you and to know who we are in you. God, I pray for that blessing for each and every one who who is listening, Lord, I pray for that for each of us, God, that we would pursue you and pursue who we are in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John and Angel, for helping us remove the mask and helping us find our God-given identity. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. When we return in 60 seconds, we'll look at a scripture in which Paul instructs us on how we should live our lives with Christ. Stay with us. In this month of Thanksgiving, we're excited to send you this special daily gratitude journal with your best gift. This easy to use journal will encourage you to bookend each day with short personal reflections that bring insight and intentionality to your busy and always changing life. How can six simple questions help you better navigate life's uncertainty? Best-selling author Tish Oxenreiter invites you to lean into the rhythms that each morning and evening offers with a twice daily thought exercise focusing on gratitude, truth, grace, and more. As you reflect on three key questions near the beginning and end of your day, you will be more poised and prepared for whatever God has for you in the hours between. Request your gratitude journal today when you give. Call 888-665-4483 or donate online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for giving to Cornerstone Television. We have a scripture for you from Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. And just listen to this imagery that Paul uses here. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And guys, this just goes along so much with what we were talking about. I, I remember teaching on this one time and having two different coats and putting one off and putting one on because we understand the imagery of changing the old for the new, which is in Christ, Sydney. You know, Tom, as you were talking and as we were during the break, God just dropped in my spirit about how all of creation is groaning and waiting for the revelation and the revealing of the sons and the daughters of God. And so I just sense and I just feel that what would it look like? You know, we say times a lot of times like we plain, complain about the world and what's happening in the world. But what if God is saying in this season, when you come face to face with me, when you come before me and you know who you are in me, what 
will that look like? How will that shift your family? How will that shift your community? How will it shift your city? How will it shift the world? And so I really believe in this season that God is wanting us to do a deep internal check. You know, we have the end of the year is coming and I just truly believe that God wants to speak to you. God wants to download some things into you. God wants to get the muck and the miry clay out of you, get those roots of bitterness, all of the offense, everything out so you can shine and look like him. Repentance is so necessary. And we just encourage you to repent, to look at yourself and be like, God, these are the things that I've done. These are the things that I've been walking through. I love what Angel was just sharing about her story and her journey of just getting to that place of just such brokenness that then you realize like, all I want is you, God. That's all I want and that's all that I desire in my life. And so we just encourage you today that maybe you're in a place of brokenness or just needing to seek God in a new way. Just give us a call on our prayer line at 888-665-4483. And Amy, I know there's something in your heart as well that you want yeah, to Yeah, you know, in the Amplified, in that scripture about renewing your mind, it says having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. You know, and I kind of teased at the beginning how you go down Barnes and Nobles and there is self-help stuff nice. everywhere. And there really is a way that we are speaking to ourselves. So I love the example that they gave in their book, and I just wanted to share it in, in 20 seconds. You could be saying, I'm so ugly, I hate myself, I'm such a loser, this is going to fail, you know, everybody always leaves me, I'm the problem, I'm bad. Self-help says, oh, I am beautiful, you know, I am successful, I love who I am, you know, I am valued but there's no firm foundation with yeah. that. That's, yeah. that's, not, that's just positive affirmations. But if you want the real weightiness, if you want a real life change, say what God says about you. I am wonderfully made. I am a conqueror. I am beloved. I am pure. I'm a saint. I am gifted. It changes everything, Tom, when we grab, not what our parents said about us, not what our friends say about us, not what our, our crazy mind is saying, about, but what does God say about us? You know, God is our biggest, um, I'll, I'll use the word cheerleader, but with reality, not just like you said, uh, Amy, positive affirmation, but with positive affirmation after understanding who we really are, understanding what he wants to do, because he wants to do something beautiful inside of you, knowing who, who we are now and what he's changing us into, Sid. Mm -hmm. So we're just so grateful that you've just been joining us for this conversation and we just pray that during this conversation, during this time together, that you would trade the face of the world and say, Jesus, take my face and I just want to meet you face to face because that is the place when we are in his presence, when we're before his throne, the throne of grace, that the changing happens and we become regenerated and he renews our minds so we can be all that he's called us to be. We love you so much, friend, and we pray that this blesses you and that you would walk in the power and love of Yeshua today.